Good afternoon on today's Angry Bulletin. Our planet is in a cosmic shooting gallery, and currently, NASA has no immediate plans to give us any sort of defense against the incoming bullets. Now, this is not currently a problem, even with a couple of recently discovered asteroids, but another asteroid, due to possibly make impact in October of this year, will not only be impossible for NASA to stop, it could create a cataclysm with global consequences, and one day, our luck is going to run out. All of this and more coming at you on The Angry Astronaut right now. Good afternoon, and once again, welcome to another Angry Bulletin. Thank you very much for joining me. As many of you probably know, the ones who follow my channel, from time to time, I talk about asteroids, hazardous asteroids, and the potential consequences of one of these rocks were to hit us. Or even worse, if a comet were to hit us at some point in the future. But what makes me the angriest is the fact that NASA still does not have any sort of immediate plan to deal with a threatening asteroid, an asteroid that is going to have an imminent impact in the time that it would take NASA to throw together another DART mission, for example, the DART mission being a test where an asteroid was was successfully intercepted and knocked off its course. In the time it would take them to get another one of these missions ready, well, we probably wouldn't get it off the ground in time before impact actually transpired. And why is this? Well, it's because there is a vast number of asteroids in our solar system that we still are not actively tracking. And even if we are tracking them, we don't have enough data to accurately determine where these asteroids are likely to go in the near future. For example, we detected two relatively small asteroids just this year, both of which are going to make close approaches to our planet. And by close, I'm talking a tiny fraction of an astronomical unit, not, you know, a few thousand kilometers or anything like that, giving us a safe berth, that's for certain. But if we were to detect an asteroid very much like one of these, which, by the way, are very difficult to find, and it was on a collision course with us in the next few months, we would not have any means of deflecting it. And that is an unacceptable situation. But it gets even worse than that. Because in 2007, we found an asteroid that we only catch fleeting glimpses of every now and then. And when we do catch sight of this asteroid, it's very, very difficult to determine in that short amount of time when we gather that data where it is actually going to go. And it's very possible that that asteroid might make impact with our planet later this year. And once again, NASA is completely unprepared to stop it. Now, the first asteroid of concern, this year anyway, in our cosmic shooting gallery is 2024 LV-2. 2024, of course, referring to the year that it was discovered. Now, we have nothing to worry about in the near future when it comes to this asteroid because it passed us, giving us a pretty big margin. We're talking a couple million kilometers on June 11th, 2024. But the reason we should be concerned about asteroids like this is because we didn't even know that this asteroid existed until a few months ago. We are ill prepared to stop an asteroid under those sorts of circumstances, even if it's relatively small like this one. This asteroid is only about 70 meters in diameter, about 240 feet, and yet in spite of that relatively small size, it would still create a cataclysmic explosion if it were to collide with our planet, largely because it is strangely fast. It's not traveling as fast as an interstellar asteroid, but it's going at about 100,000 kilometers per hour. 
That's about four times as fast as Starship was traveling when it conducted its re-entry a little while ago. So very, very fast and big enough to create a very serious problem. How big of a problem? Well, let's go ahead and pull up our favorite asteroid impact simulator to see just how serious this impact might be. Now, first of all, we're going to put the impact site just outside of London because, well, I've decided to live in this region of the world, so I'm going to start blowing it up. So here we go. Kaboom! The resulting crater is two miles in diameter, approximately three kilometers. About 27,800 people are killed, but the reason that so few people are actually killed in the crater is because the vast majority of them have been killed by the fireball before the crater even finishes forming. We're talking about a crater about 400 meters deep, and the force of the explosion, by the way, is the equivalent of 365 megatons of TNT, the equivalent of about seven Tsar Bombas, the biggest nuclear weapon ever set off by the human species. And now we have to look at the fireball. This is what has the most cataclysmic effect on human life in the region. We're talking a fireball about four and a half kilometers wide, just under three miles, and an estimated 1.5 million people would die in this fireball. An estimated 700,000 would receive third-degree burns. About 1.76 million people would receive second-degree burns with clothing catching on fire within a distance of about 12 kilometers of the impact, or just over 8 miles. And there would also be trees catching on fire within about 30 kilometers of the impact, or about 20 miles. So we're talking talking a firestorm 60 kilometers in diameter. Now we're only just getting started because you'd also be subjected to a 240 decibel shock wave, which would kill a little over a third of a million people, delivering lung damage to anyone within about 13 kilometers of the impact. Anyone within about 18 kilometers would have ruptured eardrums, buildings within nearly 30 kilometers would collapse and homes within approximately 40 kilometers would collapse. We are talking widespread and utter devastation and the fun isn't over yet. We also have to talk about the unbelievable and unprecedented windstorm. A windstorm that would peak out at over 12,000 kilometers per hour at the center of the impact zone, delivering the force of an EF5 tornado to a massive region of southern England. Over 2.2 million people essentially all all the remaining survivors in the blast zone would be dead from the wind. You're talking wind within approximately nine kilometers would be faster than the storms on Jupiter. Homes within 14 kilometers would be completely leveled, the ones that hadn't collapsed from the shockwave, and then with a pro within approximately 30 kilometers, it would feel like you were inside an EF5 tornado. Nearly all trees within a distance of 40 five kilometers would be knocked down. However, this level of devastation, although impressive, absolutely pales in comparison to the other object that we've recently discovered, dubbed 2024 CR9. This one, although traveling a lot slower, is also much, much bigger. We're talking over 420 meters, or about 1,400 feet in diameter. How bad is this one going to be? Well, we can calculate calculate that by talking about the other asteroid that's going to be a problem perhaps in the very near future. And why do we need to be worried by the way about this third asteroid, one that we actually discovered in 2007? Well, it's because we don't get to see it very much. There's an observation period on this asteroid of only a little over 3 days during every orbital period. Why 
is this? Well, it's because during most of this asteroid's orbital path takes it behind the sun, at least in comparison to our own orbit. So the asteroid is hidden in sunlight the vast majority of the time. We only really get a clear look at it approximately three days, a little bit more than that, during every orbital period. It is that perfectly hidden behind the sun. By the way, there are quite a number of asteroids that are hidden in sunlight that we really have no idea where they are. Some of them could be colossal planet killers for all we know. However, this one, although not a planet killer, would still really ruin our day pretty much planet-wide, at least for a short period of time, and perhaps even longer than that. This asteroid, as I suggested before, is not planet killer size, but still, we're going to switch over to feet here since I'm going to have it impact in the United States. It's about 1,400 feet in diameter. And if it follows the orbital trajectory that we plotted during the last time that we observed it, sometime on October 3rd, a little less than four months from now, we might have impact. Now, the odds of this are vanishingly small, because once again, the data that we get from every orbital observation period is very, very limited. By the way, it would be so helpful if we had another satellite in a position that could more accurately observe all of the asteroids that are currently lost to us in the glare of the sun, but in spite of the fact that these satellites have been proposed over and over again over the last couple of decades, NASA has never received the necessary funding to track these asteroids accurately. So once again, a little less than four months from now, this asteroid might strike us. And again, not a big chance, but if it did, the consequences would be, well, earth shattering. Let's go ahead and find out just how bad by having this asteroid impact somewhere in northern New Jersey, not in New York, not even directly in the middle, middle of a populated area. Let's see how bad it is when it's on the outskirts of a populated area. Kaboom! To coin a phrase, this is some next level shit. This asteroid would dig a crater 3.9 miles wide and over 1,600 feet deep, delivering an explosion the equivalent of three gigatons of TNT. Not megatons, gigatons. Three billion tons of TNT, which would create a fireball large enough to set half of New Jersey ablaze, along with all of New York City and also a substantial portion of southern New York State, over 6.1 million people being killed instantly, about 2 million more receiving second-degree burns, clothing catching on fire within 23 miles of the impact, and trees catching on fire within 49 miles of the impact. We are talking about a firestorm four times the size of the largest firestorm in recorded history. A firestorm that would no doubt grow, and given the fact that burning buildings would be a big part of this firestorm, there would be a lot more soot involved in this fire, and also a lot more debris getting thrown up into the upper atmosphere, creating a nuclear winter. There's no question that at least a small-scale nuclear winter would be the result of an impact like this. And again, we are just getting started. We need to talk about the 241 decibel shockwave that would kill 722,000 people immediately. Anyone within 18 miles would likely receive lung damage from an explosion like this, 23 miles away to have ruptured eardrums, buildings within 40 miles would collapse, and homes within 53 miles would collapse. 106 mile diameter zone of utter devastation. It would take years for the local emergency and reconstruction bureaus to have any effect whatsoever on a disaster of this scale. So yeah, maybe not a planet killer, but still really, really awful. 
and we're still not done. We need to talk about the wind peaking out at 8,694 miles per hour, killing an estimated 4.1 million people. The wind within 12 miles of the impact zone would be faster than the storms on Jupiter. Homes within 20 miles would be completely ripped off their foundations within 35 miles. Well, pretty much the same result. All of that being subjected to the power of an EF5 tornado. All trees within 58 miles would be knocked down. A 120 mile diameter region of devastation. Now, the odds of this actually happening in October, as I suggested before, are very small. We're talking about 11 million to one. However, the odds of winning the Powerball lottery in the United States is over 200 million to one. So if we're willing to take the chance of winning a lottery seriously, why should we not also take the possibility of a cataclysm like this seriously? All we need is a DART mission to be ready to go, either ready to launch or preferably in orbit around the moon, perhaps in conjunction with the Lunar Gateway, ready to launch against any incoming rocks that might threaten us in the future. And if we just did that, we might never have to have a conversation like this again, because the big, very difficult to deflect planet killers, well, we know where most of those are now, and it's pretty unlikely that any of them are going to be hitting our planet within the next century or two. However, the smaller ones, we still have not tracked down the vast majority of these rocks, and as we have seen, even the smaller ones can still have a devastating impact, at least regionally and perhaps even on a global level. I would like to thank the following awesome people, David McIntosh, and also Toxic. Not only did Toxic join he upgraded his membership right away also and then warren james thank you so much for becoming my latest patreon supporters it is you guys that are going to make it possible for me to travel to saxivore to cover the upcoming launch of rfa1 the first ever orbital mission launched from western europe at least vertical orbital mission and hopefully a successful mission and also it's people like you that made it possible for me to return home to deal with a family crisis. Yes, I'm going back to the United States. It wasn't my plan, but something that I am absolutely having to deal with right now. So I'd like to thank the support of all of my awesome Patreon supporters and others who made it possible for me to get back home at a very important time in my life. So once again, thank you very much for watching. Please like, Please subscribe, and as always, stay angry about space.